Welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II, and the idea behind these conversations is to expand our knowledge of plasma and traditional neon, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential of rare or noble gases by learning from those that use them. We'll be talking with artists, makers, and researchers. Each guest will offer their unique knowledge and experience regarding the art, science, and history. The intro is boosted by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist that loves to produce chill and happy music, and does so for copyright-free use. Be sure to support his music by crediting the use, subscribing, and or by donation. If you like what you hear, you can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. In today's podcast, we'll be talking with James Akers, a neon sculptor and self-proclaimed waiver and hacker artist. James is an artist, educator, and mad scientist who has an explosive approach to making. Graduating from Alfred University with a BFA in 2015, he is constantly thriving for change and fascinated by waves of all kind, sound, light, electricity. He is synthesizing a new mindset, the hacker artist. James Akers has shown his work internationally, been a recipient of public art commissions, and has received numerous awards and grants for his practice. Up until his recent move to Arlington, Texas, with his lady Allie Feeney, who is pursuing her MFA at UTA, he was teaching Neon at the Chrysler Museum of Art, and was the head processor at Real Deal Neon. Currently, he's pursuing new work and new possibilities in Neon and Plasma, known for packaging his ideas of art and life by creating a series of highly exhibitable electric sculptures. We'll look into his transition from ceramics to glass, and by extension neon, his unique approach to neon tube bending with found objects and video installation, and defining what a waiver and hacker artist is. Well, um, when I was started, got started with neon through um, my schooling, my studies, at Alfred University, um, where I was in Fred Sheeta's Intro to Glass class, and I was hooked actually on glass blowing. And then um, my friend uh, Denzel Russell at the time, he said, uh, "Well, Denzel, uh, he said uh, we were blowing glass together, and he said uh, you should try neon. It's even more fun than glass blowing." And I said, "No way." At the time, I thought neon was kind of stupid. I was like, who would want to make beer signs? Um, and uh, little did I know, um, after he, Denzel told me that, I, I had to try it. So I talked to Fred, who was a teacher, and he's a neon teacher too. And he said, just show up. Um, he's, he's in the next semester. So the next semester, I just sat in on Thursdays and Friday mornings. I would just wake up early and go sit in on this neon class with at the time, I, was, I wasn't even, I was a sophomore, I wasn't even really technically eligible to take that, it was a junior class, so, uh, but I just sat in, and, uh, you know, I learned to bend, and then after I got my first piece pumped, I was so hooked, um, it was this colored light that suddenly my art was jumping off the table and off the wall and radiating everywhere and surrounding everyone, and, um, uh, at that point, when I saw that colored red light, I knew that I had to have more, and I was became super addicted. And I was skipping my ceramics classes um, and sculpture classes to like go on neon road trips to Madison, Wisconsin, and um, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so that's how I got introduced. And then, uh, I mean, and then after that, I went to Italy. And at this time, I was a complete nerd, and I was like trying to find neon shops in Europe. And then I um, continued that love with Sarah Blood um, because Fred retired. That was the last class. And then uh, so Sarah Blood really kind of refined things more. So what were you working in before you got into neon? Um, Before I was in neon, um, I was really into ceramics, actually. Um, That's what actually got me to go to Alfred. 
and before then I was into painting and and from from as long as I can remember it was it's been art um art and video games and skateboarding and playing guitar but um ever since I went to Alfred um everything else that wasn't art has really taken like a back seat and my life's been sort of taken over so by art um and glass blowing and neon so um so yeah I came to Alfred for ceramics and then that quickly fell to the wayside when I had had a glass and glass class and a video class and then from then on it was like all about um video and electricity and glass and so after after um after college you what did you do then so after college i um i was fortunate i got to go um i got into, into this assistantship at the Chrysler Museum of Art down in Norfolk down in the glass studio and i got the traveling assistantship position so i had a housing paid for for the first summer that i was down there and um they wanted they had this new um neon it stood for new energy of Norfolk it was the new arts district in town, and it just so happened that Hannah Kirkpatrick was interested in neon, and she was trying to. They were trying to start a neon shop. And at the time, I built with Sarah's help. I had built a mobile neon manifold um, at Alfred, and I offered to take it down. And I really wanted to take it down with me um, to start a, a neon shop there. And um, I was gonna. I ordered all the stuff to like make a bombarder and everything. Uh, but they really didn't have a place to put it. I mean, the space, that space is so tight. Um, they're getting an expansion, and maybe they'll put one in. Mm-hmm. But the space was so cramped um, that there was really no spot for it. But I did do neon. I, I continued to use the mobile neon manifold down there um, to pump, like, really experimental, more performative um, plasma pieces in the hot shop using soft glass. So um, it was out there, and... Um, and there's still a lot of people interested um, in doing plasma neon there. Um, but uh, I also got involved with the sign shop um, and then ended up, at, when I was at Alfred, I kind of shunned bending letters. I didn't want to bend any words or anything. But then when I got to Norfolk um, and I needed money, um, I found that people would pay me money to bend words. So, um, and I would get paid to bend words for signage at this sign shop. So. A guy, Brian Real, took me on as his apprentice, um, and he was just opening up his own shop. I literally walked in the first day he had his manifold hooked up, and I had pieces that I hadn't pumped from Alfred. He was like, well, bring him in. Like, I mean, I met him on Instagram, and he told me, like, look me up when you get down here. Um, and he put, like, money, money, money next to it. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I got a job after I graduated. So <laughs> it really worked out perfectly. Um, and uh then I just got, I mean, I was already a nerd um, for Neon when I came down there and it just uh, expanded. But Brian would show me um, all kinds of sign tricks and then I would show him just cool glass stuff. Like I'd bring in hand-pulled tubes that he would ne- had never seen before and I'd show him all kinds of like single electrode and plasma techniques. I mean, showing that to someone who's done science his whole life, um, he like kind of blew, blew him away a little bit. So. It was really yeah. great to do that. I kind of had that similar experience when I first tried to do my first plasma piece with um, a neon technician in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, he just kind of never saw yeah. this process before. It was very new to him. Um, taking a step back here, yeah. um, what kind of space is the Chrysler Museum? I mean, there's a lot of different studios kind of have their own different flavor. What, what can you tell us about the Chrysler Museum from working there and um, being part of that environment? So as um, well, I started out as assistant, and then I got hired as a contractor to teach um, really neon classes. And um, the Chrysler is a it's a, well, they've got the Chrysler Museum of Art, um, which has like thirty thousand objects in it, and a third of that is glass. And it's the Chrysler because of Walter Chrysler, who was one of the sons of the car fortune, the Chrysler cars. Um, and that son, Walter Chrysler, he spent his money of a fortune on art, and he collected art, and he got really into collecting glass art. So that's why they have this big glass collection. And the studio was actually built as a result of that glass collection to help educate the public 
um, as to that. So it's a similar setup to Toledo, but I like to think that um, Chrysler is a bit more progressively thinking. <laughs> um, uh, and Charlotte Potter had a huge role in shaping that place. She kind of turned it from, um, like, the original, like, job when she got there was, like, a studio tech position, and she made it into so much more. And um, and she brought in all these visiting artists, like, some of the same artists, like, Tuskinski, like, the same artists that were in the museum were actually working at the studio and developing new work at the studio. So mm. um, as, like, an assistant and someone who's working there, to be able to work alongside all these amazing visiting artists that come through, like, every, like, there's probably, like, two, at least, at least two a month. Um, and then they have this third Thursday performative glass art series um, that, that Charlotte really started. Um, and that was also really incredible because every third Thursday of the month, there was um, either a visiting artist or um, some of the artists that were in town gave a big glass art performance. And it was totally different. And I think that was one of the big things there that was really attractive and really um, one of the reasons I stayed is because um, – uh, of this constant stream of new ideas and different artists coming through. Um, so that was really important to me. They don't, I think, uh, I think it's kind of similar to Pittsburgh. I've never been to Pittsburgh where you are, but um, it seems like you've done a better job in setting up the um, the neon shop and the plasma shop there <laughs> and at the Chrysler than I did. I uh, uh, appreciate it. I mean, it was a fun uh, place. It, it took a while to kind of get that stuff together. But uh, I was working with the same constraints yeah. as yourself where I had to make it so that it was the unit that I was using to fill and evacuate pieces was mobile, yet also didn't take up a lot of space. And we had to kind of forego yeah. the use yeah. of the bombarder, one, because of safety measures, but also because that's also another piece of equipment that's taking up space. And, um, I mean, you can pretty right. much do the same kind of stuff um, using the oven or, or a kiln to process the tube. So you just have to work differently. Yeah. And in that regard, like it, it, it was, it's a perfect setup. And I hope I, t I told, um, there's a couple people there that are, um, I'll be, I'll be moving to Texas and, um, like any, um, in a couple of days actually. And, uh, there's a couple of people at the Chrysler right now that are, uh, going to be, uh, taking it up. And I said, you know, we've got pretty much everything we need, to make um, a plasma setup, um, I just didn't do it because for whatever reason I was just too busy doing this or that. And then I could always fill neon um, mm -hmm. myself, and I typically will use neon in um, my work. Although I have a bunch of plasma ideas now, um, so I'm going to be exploring those in Texas. Um, I, yeah. I know Ash mentioned them. I'll be, I'll be uh, definitely going to uh, chat up Ash. And head down to Austin. Um, and don't forget Don. Don there. Beck is there too. But, uh, so you're going to have some good stuff there. Yeah, and there. Don as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be really fun. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. But, yeah, I mean, if I if I didn't have that um, that neon shop, then I would have totally, um, I would have been like 150% committed towards um, making the Chrysler setup. Um, much more. It's just I had, we had the neon set up, and at that point, that's one of the reasons why we were okay with like abandoning the bombarder setup at the Chrysler, mm -hmm. because we could just get it all filled um, at the sign shop. So it was, mm -hmm. it was like a safety thing, and also like an ease and a convenience thing. Um, where it was like we don't have to set this up; we can just set it here. Although that didn't that didn't um, allow for a lot of the plasma works to be created, but it did right. allow for um, neon and neon classes. And um, and for like assistants and staff to be able to create me and works themselves, so that was good. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the league of being a plasma baby here. Um, I just what was it? Uh, <laughs> ooh, the first uh, actually a couple weeks ago it was the first time I ever tried to bend tubing, and you kind of saw what I came up with. Yeah. You could, if you looked at it, you could see the progression of me kind of figuring out how to bend soft glass, um, which is you know a yeah. lot more. It's a little Which different. is like 10 times more difficult <laughs> than I had actually put myself yeah. to believe it was. I was like, ah, oh, it's probably like 50 times more difficult. Ah, oh, it's about 100 times. <laughs> <laughs> it's just different, that's all. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty different from Borsilica. And it's a very different way of thinking, too. Um, I know 
when I first went to Pilchuck, they didn't have neon um, set up at the time. Um, they, they just wasn't, there wasn't an instructor there teaching it, so they didn't have it set up. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to set it up so badly. And I was there for two sessions. So I was on staff in the kitchen. And, um, and over that two, those two sessions, my brain changed the way I thought about uh, making work. And I suddenly had all these 3D plasma ideas. And then when I got back to Alfred, it was like the, the opposite shift. I found that I couldn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't make those 3D plasma ideas. And it took about a semester. And then after that semester, my brain had shifted back into making tube neon. Um, and it stayed making tube neon ever since. But now, I, um, I don't know. We, I was just at uh, Pilchuck um, helping Sarah Blood um, as a TA, teach a class. Um, and we did so much stuff there that um, I wouldn't normally do. And uh, so now my brain is really humming with uh, different ideas and also knowing that I'm going to be going down working with Ash and, um, and, and Nicholas Dean. Um, uh, yeah, my brain's really like spinning with all new ideas. So uh, I'm really excited. So who, who was the uh, technician uh, for the flat sh- studio or flat shop during your session? It was uh, Sarah Terry, and she's uh, she works at a sign shop in Seattle, uh, City Signs, and uh, and um, she's getting ready to I think take that over. I think um, she's familiar with neon and um, flame working, and she was really awesome. She was super supportive, and she had like everything we needed. I was like, Sarah, did you bring this? And she was like, Yep. But she had everything. Um, awesome. And she was always like super supportive of like we were doing all this like really crazy stuff. She was super supportive of us, which was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's shift into... And it just so happened, uh, I'm like... Go ahead. I was say, let's shift into um, uh, what what you do with your work. You kind of, we're kind of getting hints of it throughout this cu- discussion right now. But uh, what you you focus on tube bending, but you also kind of use these different kind of sound and electrical devices, and, and you pull apart toys to kind of link together these kind of installations so what is it that you, how do you approach the use of neon in your work? Well, for me, that's, um, it's about that light. Uh, like I said, that, that first time I got hooked, it was about this light. Um, so um, using neon, a lot of times um, it's about making this light. And I like letting the light, um, I'm particularly drawn to when it flashes and blinks. Um, and I'm also really into um, showing wires. Uh, which neon inevitably has a transformer and some wires. So, and also when typically when you um, will animate things, there's a lot of wires and a lot of transformers. So um, I'm really drawn to that. And um, uh, let's see. Um, also, like with when I'm drawn to plasma, it's usually about the the phenomenon and how amazing it is as an object and how amazing it is to, um, especially that first moment when you light it up, uh, that's always a really magical moment. Um, and I'm really drawn to that and showing that I'm drawn to a kind of plasma as a performative action and, um, creating this thing, um, is really, um, I'm really drawn to that. There's, 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 some, there's some kind of, there's a certain magic to that moment when you first turn it on. And when it's um, that phenomenon of the glowing light, cause it's really something um, out of this world. I mean, it's not like it's like unlike anything else that I know. Yeah, uh, and I see on your website you call yourself a waver or and a hacker artist. Now, what is that all about? What do those terms mean? So these are both terms that I've sort of conjured up. Um, I'll start with the waver. The waver is an artist that's using um, light, wa- light and sound, and these are partic- particularly generated. So, I mean, you could call every single artist a waver. That's really not, it's, it's really, it's more, the definition gets more defined. Um, it's more generated rather than reflected. So you could say that every painter is a waver, because, but that's not true because their light's being reflected. So I'm really interested in those artists that are generating it. Um, light, sound, and electrical signals. Um, those are the three key ones for waivers. So like artists like uh, Karen Donnellan uh, uses sound a lot in her practice. Um, and she's really particular about the different frequencies of the sound. 
Um, so that would be a waiver. Artists like um, uh, uh, Darsha Hewitt, she's a, a circuit bender, and um, she's really interested in the signals and the oscillations and making these the oscillations. Um, artists like Nicholas Collins, uh, Wayne Stratman, a lot of neon and plasma artists are waivers because they're in, inherently interested in this light, which is an electromagnetic wavelength. Um, so there's a, there's, that, that's the sort of definition of the waiver. Um, uh, and then the hacker artist is one um, that's sort of interesting. It's like a, it has it is, it's like two sides to it. It's like a word of two meanings. The first one is an artist as to where they work within a system and they're actively trying to change that system. So um, examples of this would be like, I mean, even Charlotte Potter um, was one when she's working within this um, institution, this museum, and uh, she knows she's actively trying to change it. Um, and she's bringing, she like, just the things she did to shape the Chrysler um, glass studio were, um, were definitely like this hack. She's like, she knows she's working with the system and she's trying to change it. Um, a lot of like contemporary glass artists, they know they're working within this glass art world and um, they're trying to change it. Um, and then so the other side of that is uh, artists that are, um, I mean, you could argue it's the same sort of thing, but it's artists working within, um, working with uh, typical technology and um, hacking it to change it. So that that doesn't have to be computers. Um, that could be, um, they, they call it hard, um, hardware hacking or physical computing. Um, Darcy Hewitt does this a lot where she'll take like uh, a DVD player and then she'll she'll take the whole thing apart and she'll make it just the motors and that open and close mechanism and she'll turn that into an instrument. So it's totally taking something that was that's intended for a specific purpose and subverting that purpose for your own. So there's okay. a lot of amazing technology out there um, and it's just being used for the same sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of creative and interesting things you can do by um, making that technology that's meant to uh, watch a movie or uh, or make a little spinning thing or make a little sound um, and making that making it to an artist's intention. Would you say this kind of follows the similar um, pathways as um, our prototyping? Um, portion of, of what is called the the hacker culture, I guess, the prototyping culture of uh, Arduino and microcomputing and uh, the making of objects or DIY? Yeah, it very much does. Um, there's something, though, that's that movement where it's like, um, I mean, that movement's, a, that movement's a very diverse and, and um, it's a very wide spectrum of people in that movement. So I can't really make it make broad generalizations because it is so diverse. It's like saying all artists are blank, fill in the blank. But um, uh, but I, I typically shun like I made a conscious effort to um, in my whole like senior year at Alfred, I made a conscious effort to not use computers um, in my practice, which I'm sh I've shifted back and forth to using them and not. Um, and I, I specifically didn't want it because like um, I'm interested in this very low budget. Um, approach to it and the very um, not using anything um, expensive um, there's a group, last group called CUD um, it's a collaborative duo and the, I talked to the both the members John Drury and Robbie Miller I believe I talked to them and they said they haven't spent a dime on their practice at all mm -hmm. everything's been donated found um, stashed away and picked up later um, so that was Super interesting. I think there's a really interesting way of working in that method. Um, right. And well, I do. I do end up spending money on things, but um, I try to. I try to do it in the cheapest way possible. So I wonder if um, during your kind of talk that any of your mentors have kind of said that. Well, if you're using any uh, even found object, that the computer is simply the object that's making and working the ob the uh, kind of computations for its function. I mean, therefore, like, a calculator could right. be a computer. Um, but the reason why I brought those into place is not to uh, bring an umbrella, but to ask if that if it follows the philosophy that many of those pathways uh, work towards. 
uh, one who um, prototypes as a way of it, it's part of a culture that wants to break down and make something uniquely and individualistic. But also DIY is about being able to do things uh, along the ideas of a professional, but within their own means and power, maybe even beyond their scope that works for them based on their budget. Right. Um, Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think computers definitely can play a role. Like you can certain like computers are electrical and they use electrical waves and they can generate sound and video. Like there's no tomorrow, but I mean, um, uh, so certainly you can be a waiver and work with computers. You can be a hacker artist and working with computers. Um, just for me personally, I've, um, I mean, I'll, I'll use them every now and then, but there's some kind of, um, there's something really special when you don't use a computer because once you use the computer, you can make just about anything happen, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, it's kind of like having the ultimate blank canvas. Like, where do you begin? And also for the audience, um, I mean, is it pre-recorded? Is it generated live? I mean, on the computer, you can basically just pre-record anything and hit play. Um, so, I don't know, there's something interesting and challenging about not using the computer, um, both conceptually and um I like to ask for an audience member knowing that, like, this is not on a computer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, these are all being generated live in front of you. And then the other thing with the computer is I find it just be hard to make um, sculptural. For some reason, I've, I uh, am satisfied with making these sculptural objects. Um, and for it's hard to make sculptural objects on the computer. That being said, making videos and exhibiting videos is amazing because you can just email the file or Dropbox the file, and suddenly you can show in China and without even ever paying to ship work. So, I mean, that in that aspect, and like storing your work, is, in that aspect, it's um, amazing to work digitally. You can share your work over peer-to-peer um, -peer networks, which is like a political statement and an amazing way to duplicate a thousand copies of your work. Um, so it has interesting conceptual um, meanings working with a computer. But um, like I said, I, I, for whatever reason, I maybe it was just going to art school and studying sculpture, I find um, I, uh, I take great, great pleasure in making these objects, these art objects. Do you ever take objects and uh, change them into being uh, switches or buttons or controls for your uh, displays? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think I remember, that's where I was really trying um, to get at when I was talking time, about like, computers. I was... I was reading books like um, Handmade Electronic Music from Nicholas Collins and Neon Engineers. I, I bought every neon book I could find and read it. Like, like, like it was like, they were like page turners to me. I was, I was so hooked and such a nerd about it. Um, so I remember reading about how to um, make neon animators. And I was so, this is another reason why I like to use low budget because I find that like poverty is like the mother of invention. Uh, when I was in school, I had almost like no money. So I was, um, uh, so I, I was trying to figure out ways to make my own transformers. I was trying to figure out ways to make my own animators and just scrounging as, just grabbing as many transformers as I could. Um, and so I found out how to make my own and I just, I used, um, Jacob Fishman's, um, his, uh, how to make like a flasher in there. And then I figured out that any, any LED blink, so I could, if I could make an LED blink, I could make neon blink. And then eventually I figured out ways to make neon blink even faster using different transformers. And then um, at that point, I could basically take any toy with an LED blink on it. And and this is the point where I'm at now, where I'm just taking, I'm finding toys that have an interesting LED blink pattern and then um, modifying those toys to give more control and then adding neon to it. And there's something really nice about this um, this children's toy that's designed to, there's something, it's interesting, like more motion, more flashing and more crazy sounds make an interesting children's toy. And those same things will make really, really interesting art installations as well. Um, and you can amplify the flashing by sort of little tiny LEDs attaching giant neons so the entire room is flashing different colors. And then also there's this silly um, and sometimes scary and just strange and bizarre sounds happening, um, especially with the different circuit, the different bends you can get in certain toys. Um, and then there's also like nothing like going to a thrift store and spending about three dollars and uh, having hours of fun and artistic exploration and spending three dollars and getting art materials for that price. Um, 
is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I could certainly relate with that. Um, there was one project that I did in school that I really liked was uh, my my instructor, uh, Brian Franklin, had us uh, choose ordinary objects and change them into controllers. And um, yeah. I had the idea, we had a, a, a pressure sensor as part of like the kit. And so I used a foam, you know, uh, what do you call it, a stress ball and made that into a, uh, a into a button or a controller. Yeah. And uh, I hooked it up with the video, you know, that you, you probably see it on YouTube, but it's the video of the car going through the countryside with beautiful music. And then all of a sudden the scary zombie face pops up. Right. Oh yeah, that freaked me out. Yeah. So what I did is I made it so that <laughs> the person had to put on earphones and they had to squeeze the ball. So I did like a million tests to figure out what pressure readings gave me a normal pressure range. <laughs> so you squeeze the ball and yeah. you're watching this video that continuously loops perfectly as it transitions back to the person coming back out in the countryside driving through. And the second you relax just <laughs> enough, it pops up and sc it scares you. So uh, it's kind of a yeah. cruel idea, but it was a it was an interesting project where you had to use a video that you found yeah. online and with the least amount of money purchase something that could or find something that could be used as a controller. Yeah, I mean, I think when when you do when you especially working with sensors and things like you described, your uh, it opens up so many possibilities, um, both conceptual and artistically uh, and just making wise for, I mean, you're, it's an endless way of working. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's really fascinating to me. So, Well, you know, uh, thank you again for your time. Um, uh, where, where are you heading up after this? Are you heading back to Texas tomorrow or what? Well, I'll be, um, no, I'll be going to, um, to another part in Maryland and I'll go to my grandma's house and then I'll, I'll go back to Virginia for just to finish up a few more things and finish packing up the car. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be going to, um, hopefully Atlanta to visit, um, a neon person down there. Um, and then Louisiana, New Orleans to visit, um, a hot caster. And this is just like spend a day in each place. So you're going on a grand be going tour. To, um, Arlington to settle down and, um, secure a job. I've got a couple job leads. Um, one's at a neon shop and, um, and then, uh, so I'll, I'll, think I'll get a job there and then, uh, and then I got to visit Ash and you said you, are you looking for jobs in Texas or are you looking, is it, are you yeah, have to travel Texas, a bit? Yeah. Um, uh, in Arlington and Dallas and Fort Worth. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Um, so I've got a couple of leads on that and then, um, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, a couple of crazy jobs there. It's like, I don't know if I want that one. Like one would send me on this crazy route and it'd be all sign maintenance stuff. I'd really rather, much rather make art. I have three priorities. Um, make art, make money, and uh, hang out with Allie. <laughs> uh, she's the reason I'm going down. She's uh, in the grad program at, at UTA. So um, there's three simple priorities, and uh, some jobs would take away from those. So i trying to meet yeah. all three. All right, till next time, Mr. James. We'll probably try to pull you into some kind of crazy big discussion thing later on, but... Uh, uh, we'll see what we get cool. next. I would love to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Percy, for having me on. I really appreciate the work you're doing here. And um, and the other, um, even like what Ash was saying, was really exciting for the Plasma Art Alliance. I'm um, really excited to have that stuff coming up. So uh, thanks so much. The outro is Reentry by Lapse. Thank you for listening to the Tammy Lightning Podcast. We have many more guests to come with future guests returning to expand on questions, practices, and a variety of subjects. I'd like to thank Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as well as encouraging me to pursue this project, as well as the Plasma Art Alliance, whom many of our guests are connected through. Keep an eye out for the next summer's classes at Pittsburgh Glass Center as we work to provide a space for learning neon and plasma. Also, I'd like to thank James for taking the time uh, to be our guest on the podcast, especially in the midst of his travels and settling in in Arlington. I wish him the best in this job search and uh, excited to see what he makes next. If you'd like to support the podcast, simply go to percyeccles.com and look for the tab Taming Lightning or by typing in taminglightning.net. 
and click subscribe. Later, there will probably be other options in the future, but for now, you can like, share, comment, and subscribe. See you next time.